Um, I worked another season with um, Blake at the time, who was my boyfriend, doing the wildlife stuff and the capture. And then at that point in time, we decided to buy our own company. And um, we then searched around. We, we knew we wanted a 135 certificate. So we were either going to have to write our own or purchase one. And um, we went and toured places and obviously financing is a huge deal. You know, when you're talking about aviation, you don't go buy something for 40,000, you buy it for millions. Yeah. And so there was a, a guy out of Lewiston, Idaho, who was looking to sell his 135 that he wrote and his R44 that was pretty much timed out. So the R44, I think had 25 or 30 hours on it, but he had the 135 and the foundation and the stamp of what we wanted. So we went out there. I will never forget. It was on Cinco de Mayo. Went out there and met him and, um, you know, talked to him and told him, you were like, hey, look, we don't have this amount of cash, but we want you to sell or finance us. We'll make these payments. And there was no house. There was no home. There was nothing. And so he's like, all right, we'll do it. So we did. Wow. And um, uh, yeah, we, uh, my boyfriend who became my husband during this point of time when we had this company, he, um, a phenomenal pilot to this day, one of the best pilots I've ever known. And, um, he had his reputation of his career. And then we had gotten to know people throughout, you know, the wildlife stuff and in Alaska. So people knew me as well. And so people were thrilled, but we had this timed out R44. And so we were promising these jobs based on the money that we hadn't made yet, but we were going to make the money, but we hadn't made it yet. And it was terrifying. It was super terrifying, like promising everything. And it's like, we obviously can't overfly. And the FAA knew that we were new. So um, <clears throat> the first year was pretty dicey. We lived in a fifth wheel trailer outside the hangar. And um, wow. we lived off of the per diem money that we would get on the jobs. And enough of those wildlife agencies took chances on us and said, we know what you're capable of. And so, yeah, the overhaul came and actually the owner helped us do it. And it was it was pretty amazing. Um, the first year we didn't just break even, we made money and we ended up over the years having to lease multiple aircraft and we upgraded to the MD 500, the D model and had employees and it was amazing. And right before, um, he had a bad accident right before that we had saved up enough money to not only build another hangar, but we had plans for living quarters up on the top of it, which, you know, was like our dream to have our hangar home there. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And but then before you get into the the story of the crash, can you kind mm -hmm. of just talk about cuz I'm really interested in the big game stuff. You talked about yeah. you know what you guys did there. Can you talk about what you kind of what your mission profile looked like and what you guys were doing cuz it really sounds interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So the Division of Wildlife or Parks and Wildlife or whatever it was in each state would hire a helicopter to help them study big game animals. So any animal that needs to be studied uh, or managed like deer, elk, moose, wolves, anything that needs to be studied, they would use a helicopter for. So the state would come out and say, hey, we have 50 elk cows that need collared. We have uh, 10 bison that need relocated. We have 100 collars for pronghorn. And so we would bid these contracts and you would bid per animal of what you thought you could capture per hour for these jobs. And so um, I would say, okay, I would look at the density of the animals and the terrain. Is it easy capture or is it tough? Or are we going to have to search a long time? And then at the beginning, it was just Blake and I, my husband and I, um, you know, doing everything. We would usually hire a gunner who would actually shoot the gun, but I would drive the fuel truck. Blake would fly. I would help with mugging. Like we would do it all. And then, um, so we would drive out to these jobs and then they'd give us these callers and then whatever the biologist wanted done, taking blood or, uh, a tooth sample or hair samples or ultrasound, we would then help them study these animals. And it helps oh. them make um, decisions on how to manage the wildlife and what are they doing mm -hmm. and where are they going and what's their genetics. And um, like, I remember doing a study in Meeker, Colorado, where the fawns were really small and Colorado is a great spot for, for deer. Well, what happened was there is too many deer and not enough forage for them. So they issued the next year, more collars for the um or not more collars more uh tags for them to hunt and then you know they just managed them to where there was enough deer per forage or whatever per acre so then the next year's fawns were even bigger because there wasn't okay. too many so you guys would pick up uh you, you, i think you termed it a, a gunner but somebody who tranquilized an animal 
from mm-hmm. the helicopter. Is yeah. That, and then, and then would you land at that point and, and then go collar the animal or would you, how would you guys do that part of it? Right. So there's two ways. So if the animal was going to bite back or hurt us like a wolf or uh, something big, like a moose, we would tranquilize them. But the tranquilizers also cost a lot of money. So we would also use a form of a net gun, which was shot out of like a stub nose 308. And then it's just a net that protrudes over the animal with four weights on it that you would just shoot. And it just kind of tangles them up enough for you to get down. So yeah, you would, you would find them, you would shoot the net or tranquilize them, and then you'd immediately get down and then work the animal up. And we wouldn't chase them or pursue them longer than two minutes. Um, We were very cautious in how we would capture them because if they died uh, up to a week after we captured them, we wouldn't get paid for it. So capturing them and keeping them alive was the goal. But yeah, we would fly with a pilot, a gunner, and a mugger. So the gunner would shoot the net gun or the dart over the animal, and then the helicopter would immediately land and the mugger would get out. And then we would have these little kits made up and it would have a data card. So we would draw the blood and we would collar it and sometimes put ear tags in it and just take all the biological samples that they would want and then kick them, go, kick them loose. And then sometimes we'd have two muggers. So we would, you know, shoot this animal, drop the mugger off while the helicopter went and got another one and just kind of hopscotch around. And so oh, what a cool profile. It was super cool. And there's still companies out there that do it this day um, that, you know, study the animals this way. And it's really cool. Like getting up on a moose, you know, when in your life would you ever get to get up on a wild yeah. moose or a wolf? or a bear or anything like that. In Alaska, we did a couple polar bear surveys, which was pretty cool to be up on those animals in real life and, you know, helping the biologists study them. Yeah. When you think back on all your experiences, do you want those animals? There's two two things I want to ask. One, is there any scary experiences you guys had? (laughs) I I would imagine like just walking (laughs) to polar bear scary, but, and then two, like anything, it's funny, but let's start with the, the scary side of it. Yeah. So, okay. I have a good, two good stories that come off my mind for that. So probably one of the scariest times is out here in Laramie, Wyoming. We were uh, working with a biologist named Kevin Monteith, who's a great guy and he's a professor and he owns a taxidermy shop. And he's just like, I think he's got like five kids. He's just all around like, you know, God's gift. He was out here starting a new study for uh, moose up in the snowy range. And so he didn't know if there was moose or whatever. We had worked for him for a couple summers. We had capture in the fall and we'd capture in the spring to check, you know, how the fat was doing on them. So in the fall, we'd hope that they'd be fat. And in the spring, we'd hope they'd still have enough fat. And there was this one moose we would re- recapture every year and she was so mean and she would challenge the helicopter and she would pin her ears back and she would stop me like coming running at us. And so uh, we were in the R44 flying at like 9,000 feet, which was terrifying super low to the ground (laughs) and so uh we didn't have enough power to do anything and we called the low rotor rpm horn it was capture music because you'd always hear it the whole time (laughs) and so uh, blake dropped me off in this big field um because he's like i don't have the power right now to take you as soon as we dart here i'll come back and pick you up and then take you over there well she had a calf by her side and so he dropped me in the middle of this field because he had to use in-ground effect to land. And I got out of the helicopter and I was like up to snow in my chest. But I'm like, whatever, I'll just stay here. So I was in the field and he chased the mom and I could hear the helicopter and he was trying to dart her. And she was really smart. She would go into the water and we can't tranquilize them in the water because the risk of them going underwater was bad. And I just look behind me and her calf is right behind me. And the calf's oh, ears are oh. just pinned. And the calf was just standing there, like stomping his foot on me. And it's a, a calf, but it's still like the size of a horse, right? Yeah. And I remember just like, all I could do, I just started like swimming in the snow to like get to, there's this like little tree. And I was doing everything I could to run and to get to this little tree. And she was like stomping me and I had my helmet on and she ripped through my hoodie with her hoof on one side wow. and she pulled my boot off wow. on my other side. And I was like terrified and I was so mad because I was like, he left me out in this field to die <laughs> and this <laughs> was going to kill me. But I finally got to the tree and she had, she was running all around it and stomping and um, yeah, my boot was out there and I was just completely pissed, <laughs> <laughs> but it was scary because I didn't know like what was going to happen. And like the helicopter yeah. eventually had to come and chase her off. So that was wow, probably that's... my scariest um, story being attacked by a baby moose. And it was a baby moose. <laughs> But it's and, still big, like you said. Yeah, they are still big. But yeah, that the mom was always so mean. So it just is trying true that, you know, the baby's mean. 
And then probably one of the funniest stories that I've ever had was in South Dakota. We were doing a pronghorn capture up there near Rapid City. And it was towards the end of the year. So it was in the springtime. And you know pronghorn, like how small they are, like an antelope. Life on one cancel standing down. <laughs> and so we were, yeah, yeah we can keep talking. <laughs> Uh, so we were, I was up in uh, Rapid, near Rapid City, and uh, it was the pronghorn, and they're so tiny, and they're so, like, spastic, and they're out in these, like, really rolling open fields, rolling open fields, and so I was out there, and I was with three of the guys, and they're like, Sam, we dare you, we dare you to ride this one, and I'm like, I'm going to smash it, like, its legs are, like, stick legs, you know, like, they're so tiny, and so um, he was like, the, the guys are like, we'll hold it. Well, cause we used to hobble their legs up. So they were like, we'll hobble it and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you on. And then, um, you know, we'll send you down this hill. I'm like, all right, all right. So I have my helicopter helmet on. And so I'm like mutton busting this thing, you know, like around its neck. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever felt antelope hair, but it's like oily and greasy and they'll like shed it if they're afraid. <laughs> so I'm like riding this thing. They let it go and it goes barreling down this hill. And I thought it, I would fall off or I thought it would crumple or nope. I got to go into like 50 miles an hour with this thing. And at that point, <laughs> I didn't know like when or how I could let go. And then it ended up tripping once and we somersaulted and I never let go. And I was like still riding it. <laughs> so I rode this thing all the way down. And I finally fell off and I just had this like tufts of hair in my hand. <laughs> Where I've That's ridden funny. this thing all the way down. But yeah, and then they actually had to like fly the helicopter down to come pick me up because <laughs> they're Not like, so far. yeah, they're like, we can't believe you rode it that far. 